Very glad to have Perry back to provide this keynote um, on a topic that obviously we all crave to hear his views on, which is inflation. And the title of the talk is a money view of inflation, the fourth price of money. Uh, those of you who study the money view know that the fourth price of money is the fourth in the sequence. Let's, let me see if I can get it right. The exchange rate, the interest rate, the and par, which we can talk about later if those, those of you don't know, but the fourth one is the price level. Those are the fourth prices of money uh, that we study in the money view. And uh, those of you who've been around know that the fourth price of money has always been maybe um, one that has not been developed, developed uh, as strongly because it's not so close to the settlement constraint, not so close to uh, the moment of payment as where Perry start, has his departure from. So quite curious to see where he develops this view. Uh, let me also use the opportunity to uh, welcome Pablo Bortz, a uh, long-time YSM member um, who is now professor at the University of San Martin in Argentina. He will serve as a discussant. So um, if we're all ready, uh, just like to welcome Perry to the stage. Um, Perry, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint. Um, okay. You can see that? All good? Yes, we're good. We and you can fine. see me? All right, good. Um, so let me just get started then. Um, as Jay says, um, the fourth price of money is is the price level. Um, and it has been uh, a an, a piece of unfinished business for a, a long time. Um, the uh, people have been pointing this out to me for a long time and asking me, how, what does the money view have to say about the price level? And I, I want to tell you that I quite, in fact, that was even when I was doing monetary economics um, 30 years ago, you know, my, my senior colleague, Duncan Foley said, what's your theory of the price level? And I said, I don't have one. And I think that that's a very hard problem. And I think that the reason people aren't making progress on it is because we need to solve simpler problems first. And so that's what I did. Okay, par, I always use par as the first rate, the first price of money, by the way, Jay, par, interest rate, exchange rate. Um, and that's what the MOOC is all about is those three prices. So, but the point is that the fourth price of money for sort of mainstream oh, economics, no. okay. The, the fourth price of money is the is the is the thing they're mainly concerned about. Um, and so that that turned out the fact that I ignored the fourth price of money meant that for a long time, uh, it was not at all clear what the relationship between the money view and mainstream economics was because we were just sort of ships passing in the night. We were talking about different things. Um, and that was partly intentional two um so today we're actually confronting standard economics um in a very forthright way and that makes me a little nervous um but it's time um uh maturity um let me say that uh before the first substantive slide um i want to also ha do a, a a shout out to dan nielsen who's who's here and who you'll be hearing from uh l later on it was it was dan who not only told me I needed a fourth price of money, but he tried to uh, uh, push and he wrote me a little memo about this called a theory of real liquidity, I believe it was. I believe that was in 2011. Okay. So, and I looked at this and it didn't seem to me, I couldn't see where to go from that back then. Um, but uh, I remembered that. And so in 2021, when I was finishing up the Kindleberger book and Kindleberger, as you'll see had some views about the price level himself um, that I thought were maybe showed a direction forward. And so I reconnected with Dan and we started working together. So this talk, although it's just me talking, um, is is in fact joint work um, with Dan um, a couple of summers, I guess, 21, 22, 23. And we made a lot of progress basically in the last month um, because I had committed to giving this talk. <laughs> so nothing like uh, 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 hangman's noose to focus focus the mind. Um, so here we go. So what I want to begin with is just to bring up to your attention 
um, the standard theory of the price level, um, that if you're a graduate student in economics um, or a professor of economics, um, you will know. And I'm taking this from a, a review paper of Ricardo Reis and, and Castillo Martinez that's coming out in the Journal of Economic Literature, I believe, pretty soon, that's titled, How Do Central Banks Control Inflation? A Guide for the Perplexed. And it's a, it's a survey of, of, the, of, the, of the orthodox literature. Probably, you know, it could, what, what happens in a standard graduate macro class. Um, and I, I pull out one quote, he says, um, or they say, um, without a central bank, there's nothing to pin down the price level. Without a central bank, there's nothing to pin down the price level. So the orthodox theory of the price level is that this is something the central bank does for us through its operations. And we're going to see, um, I'll just point out to you that um, this has to do with the classical dichotomy, um, this notion that 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 the determinants of real things, relative prices, are different than the determination of nominal things, that money is a veil that's hiding and obscuring underlying real operations, um, and that the central bank is, modern central banks, are, are, are pinning down the price level through this thing called the Taylor Rule, um, and which I'm going to see in, in, in a minute. Um, and uh, I am directly countering all of this stuff, you know, that the money view views the mon monetary system as the infrastructure of the market economy, not as a veil, okay, but as infrastructure. Um, and uh, we're thinking about the banking system as having its own way of determining interest rates. It's not just the central bank, okay? There's there's a there's a theory of interest rates that is separate from the central bank. And what we're trying to do today is to extend that to a theory of the price level as well, so that we have a theory of the price level that that works even if there isn't a central bank, which of course there hasn't always been a central bank. So it that, that this this theory that requires a central bank seems of very limited use historically at, at any rate. Um, I warn you because I'm in, because I'm my main focus is kind of on the standard um, uh, theory, academic theory. Um, to some extent, this, the, the, a bias of this talk is it's about the global north um, and specifically the dollar. But there are implications for the global south, which I'll come to at at the end a little bit. And I mention that particularly because of my discussant who will take me to task on exactly this point. Um, I'm sure. I don't know that. But I, if he didn't, I would be surprised. Um, so here's the, here. this is what I'm trying to provide an alternative to. Um, and uh, the uh, so I have just for entertainment section here, this is a little uh, clip from The Wizard of Oz. Um, Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Um, you may remember that. I have. I don't have the the sound working, but you can see the little to dog Toto is pulling aside the curtain, and you see that the Wizard of Oz is there, and he is a humbug. He is not actually a wizard. He's just a guy. Um, and uh, this is an. This is in fact a uh, uh, Wizard of Oz. The whole thing is in fact uh, about about U.S. monetary arrangements. <laughs> that was what was in his mind um, when he was creating this. And so it, in fact, was about central banking, uh, as a matter of fact. But so let me just stop that and we'll move on. Um, that's the entertainment portion. Now we the, that's to soften you up for an equation. Um, so here's the Taylor rule, um, which we think of as the central bank reaction function. Um, capital R is, is my notation for nominal interest rate. The nominal interest rate that the central bank sets, okay, is equal to a real interest rate, okay, that is presumably outside the control of the of of the of the central bank. It is from the real economy, okay, um, and it sets it by uh, looking at the expectation of inflation relative to a target uh, pi star. Pi is my notation for inflation, and over adjusting. Right? The Fisher effect says that nominal interest rates are real interest rates plus expected inflation. The central bank is going one better than that by over adjusting. And, that that, and, and so the idea of modern economics is that that over adjustment um, is what stabilizes the price level. And the way it does it is through, uh, there's an intertemporal general equilibrium going out into infinity, um, and there's a terminal condition that's imposed on the model that rules out explosive paths and pins down the price level. So by responding to inflation, you're pinning down the price level today. That's how that's how the math of it all works. Um, and then there is a million different variations, time variation of various kinds and so forth, but that's the, the, the gist of it. And 
what I'm pointing out here is that there hasn't always been a central bank. So what's your theory of the price level when there's not a central bank? Well, the money view was developed by Badgett and other people. You know, we, you could say it's gold, okay? Um, but we don't have a gold standard either. So the price level, the theory of the price level is a problem for the money view, okay, as well as for the the neoclassical monetary theory. Um, and that's what I want to, I want to rise to that challenge Um today to try to address that. Um, you may note in the MOOC, many of you have taken the MOOC, that I sort of treat the price level as determined by that that there is a gold standard. And the first time I, I in the very first lecture, I have a hierarchy of money with gold at the top as international money money. And I and I and that helps to put the price level sort of on this on a side so that I don't have to talk about it. Okay. But I know that's not true. Um and uh and I think that wasn't true even under the gold standard so much. Um but uh but it it helped me focus on the first three prices, which is what the MOOC is all, all about. Now I wanna really focus on that fourth price of money. I want to maybe a little digression here, and I'm gonna say more about this tomorrow when I talk about, about Badgett. Um, why, why do economists care about the price level so much? What, where does that come from? And I think one candidate for that is 1875, this book by William Stanley Jevons called Money and the Mechanism of Exchange. Um, and it's pretty clear if you read that book that what he's concerned about, and in fact, what, the, the population of economists, or maybe you wouldn't even call them so much, you know, this is the beginning of the professionalization and academization of, of economics. They see fluctuation in the price level as a source of, of, of social friction um, between creditors and debtors, right? If the price level changes, then somebody wins and somebody loses. The person who owes money um, either wins or loses. The person who is owed money either wins or loses. And that source of that that can that can be a source of social friction. Similarly, um, if the price level changes, that's a source of friction in the labor market uh, because wages are set in money terms. And so if prices change, then you have to redo all these labor contracts and that can lead to labor descendants. So what, what the idea is that we want to stabilize the price level, okay? And second idea, that pegging the pound sterling to gold seems not to do the trick, seems not to do the trick because gold itself fluctuates in value. And so, so, that's, so we need to have some kind of of way of stabilizing the, the 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 price level, and this becomes he, here he's proposing something he calls the tabular standard. So it was a it was a contractual standard for writing contracts that you could write contracts so they're indexed basically is what he's doing. Um, later on, um, economists said no, we don't have to do that. What we'll do is just have a central bank that will stabilize the price level. But this is the origin of it in 1875. And I point this out because um, Walter Badgett, um, then the, the editor-in-chief of The Economist, um, wrote a review of money and the mechanism exchange um, in The Economist, a critical review. Um, and uh, I see Walter Badgett as a natural money view thinker, and his criti criticism of the emerging academic orthodoxy is right there at the very beginning. This is the origin of neoclassical monetary economics. Um, in fact, David Laidler, the great historian of neoclassical monetary economics, starts the story with exactly this, money and the mechanism of exchange. And it was he who drew my attention to this review by Badgett also. Um, so it's distributed Distribution that causes people that causes economists to want to stabilize the price level, um, and then they're looking for a mechanism to do that, um, and the central bank is that mechanism. Here's what Badgett says in 1875 in his review, um, and it's it's I think it's telling from a from a money view point of view. Look at his four uh, objections. He says it's wholly unfit for a nation which has a foreign trade. Okay, so he's thinking about global. He's thinking about globally about this, um, and that stabilizing your own price level doesn't do anything about other people's price levels and, and facilitating international trade. And so, and he wants to facilitate international trade. And, and secondly, it would make banking impossible. So banks are, are, are issuing promises to pay money and they're, and they're accepting loans, their loans um, are, and, and they're getting money. They're, they're a cash flow operation. They're receiving cash and paying out cash. Um, banking would be impossible with this tabular standard because you keep having to adjust how much you pay and you would never know what you owe. So he's thinking as a banker about this, which of course Jevons is not. 
Uh, third objection, it would be necessary to preserve most elaborate standards of the articles which constitute the standard. Well, that we know is exactly what we do. This is what this is what we have a big government bureaucracy. When when Jay asked, you know, what is the inflation rate in your country? Okay, everyone was able to answer. Why is that? Because there's these statistical bureaus that are calculating all this stuff. Okay, but in 1875, that seemed a, 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 an insuperable objection. Um, so we did solve that problem um, with with a government a government statistical apparatus. Um, last one, fundamental fault of the principle. Um, in a in a good currency, the the paying medium paying medium ought either to be identical with or readily interchangeable into a definite quantity of the standard of value. The standard of value he's speaking of in 1875 is in fact gold. Okay, so he is objecting to the notion that sterling is going to be that that the paying medium, which is sterling, should be tied to gold, not and shouldn't be adjusted. You know by the by, by this tabular standard. So so we're going to come back to some of these points, but it, my my point right now is to say that this issue of of what is the fourth price of money according to the money view was an issue in 1875. Okay. And it's an issue today. Bankers, practical bankers like Badgett, and uh, went separate direction from academics. So that's back in 1875. There become separate literatures, and I'm showing this as as David Laidler's book, which is about the golden age of the quantity theory. is actually about the the evolution of neoclassical monetary theory. Okay, that's what it is. And one of these fellows is Jevons, I think, the one on the top, and one is is Vixell and. Um, so this is the story. This academic economics started with Vic, started with with Jevons and proceeded through an internal logic, basically paying no attention to events in the world that happened um, after 1875. Even as Britain became the center of the world economy, um, the international gold standard. So the history, this this great book by Marcello De Cecco, Money and Empire. Um, is a story of the sterling system, the international gold standard, um, in other words, um, in its heyday and start of decline, 1890 to 1914. Um, you will remember that I, I titled my book, Money and Empire, in homage to Marcello de Cecco, um, and to tell everyone that he's telling about the sterling system, I'm telling about the dollar system. Um, and so it's a sequel to Marcello de, de Cecco, and I identify myself with him. And so the economic historians are tracking what's happening in the world, okay, but the monetary economists, okay, are not. They're 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 developing a model which does not have a theory of the price level except this Deus ex machina, the central bank coming in from outside. Um, there was a small minority group, okay, always, who read both of these literatures and said, look, we have to have a bridge between them, okay? And I think of the key currency literature as people like that, okay? Now, that that, that there was a conversation that was happening in Britain, but the but the important conversation more, more was in the United States because the center of the world economy shifted from London to New York. Uh, so I, I placed the start of the American conversation with John, John H. Williams, 1934. Um, this is after the collapse of Sterling in 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 September of 1931, um, and uh, there and and the and the inability to make an easy transition to a dollar system in 1933, which is what he was promoting. This is the article. This is the the speech that he gave in London during during the attempt to put that system together, and it didn't work, and so we had a Great Depression instead. Dupre, Emile Dupre was a student of John H. Williams, undergraduate at Harvard, um, and he then went to the Fed after that, and and he and he met, that's where he met uh, Charlie Kindleberger, um, and they became buddies, and they wrote wrote together, um, and uh, so I think of that this this key currency tradition as the post-war uh, main advocates of it in the United States were Dupre and Kindleberger, um, and there was a third author, Salant, in their famous 1966. Uh, 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 economist article. Um, the uh, uh, the world in depression was a uh, was one of he has a theory there about why why their depression was so long um, and it was about the breakdown of the international monetary system and he proposes there also a theory of deflation okay that has to do with what he calls a ratchet 
um, between exchange rates and the domestic price level. So there's a theory of deflation, a theory of inflation that is in this book, okay, that he developed later. And that is where, as I said at the beginning, that's where I started to say, okay, you're you're a money view guy, you know, you let me start there. Maybe there's some ideas there. And then the fourth one I'm pointing out here um, is Hicks. Now, Hicks, of course, is a Brit, um, A Market Theory of Money, the last book he wrote before he died. And I've come to read that book um, also as a key currency book, okay, which I did not originally because I wasn't doing international economics. Um, and um, that's the book where I got the idea of the centrality of the dealer function that 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 Jay mentions as a as a as a basic building block of the money view. Um, it was extremely important for me. You can see the date, 1989. So I want to build on that book because he is starting starts that book. For those of you who've read it, the first four chapters are about commodities markets and commodity prices. Okay. And the last chapter is about inflation. So he is thinking, he is trying to bring his theory of money into contact with the theory of commodity prices. Um, and uh, and I want to start there, okay? And I want to add in things that were not available to him. Um, the survival constraint that Jay mentions, um, this is just uh, from Minsky's dissertation, actually, 19, 1954, um, which was not published until much later. So that was unavailable to Hicks. He didn't see that. And the dealer function, so this this particular model of Jack Trainer, which I discovered when I was writing the, the book about Fisher Black, um, and I have used, and I realized, you know, that's, I can do a lot with that, okay? Um, he's thinking about an individual security dealer, um, and I moved that into macroeconomics and I moved that into the money markets and also ex exchange dealers and so forth. So those two ideas, the survival constraint in the payment system and the dealer function, I want to bring to Hicks, okay, in order to move that that intervention that he made in 1989, okay, into the modern into the modern world. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. So as we were thinking, Dan and I were thinking about this, um, we started with Kindleberger, okay? And I, as we were thinking about it, I think we came to realize that that was too special a theory, okay? That there was, because uh, that's a theory for breakdowns, for in the, the deflations of the 30s and the inflation, stagflation, in fact, of the 70s too. He used the same the same uh, theory in reverse. Um, so we, what we are proposing today, and this is, the first time I've ever given this talk to anybody. Okay, so this is I'm just interested in in having an audience that is maybe mildly sympathetic to that, and they're and because they're money view curious, I suppose this is my attempt to build a theory, our attempt to build a theory of price that comes from a money view framework, and and it and so there's three levels of this. There's sort of three theories depending on what's happening macroeconomically. Um, the the theory for normal times is what I is what I call the inside spread theory, okay, which is which is about flow supply of of commodities meeting flow demand, and there's an imbalance in general, which is absorbed by dealers, um, and for a price for a profit, um, and uh, that's and that's where the price level sort of comes from. We're going to see this in a little more detail, and it is that system that the central bank is intervening in um, in order to manage the price level if it wants to. Okay, It's intervening through the dealer's balance sheet, um, and we'll see that. So that's a sort of trainer kind of idea. Okay, um, The outside spread economy is, is when the dealers have, have, ha are used, have used up their inventory capacity. And so there is no, there's no longer a dealer system that is functional in, turning, in determining these prices. Um, and that's the second le level of the theory, which is an outside spread economy, which is either a seller's market or a buyer's market. Um, and one thing about that is that you see if your main purchase on the system is through the dealer's balance sheet and the dealers are no longer doing anything, then you lose purchase okay, on the system. Um, so the inefficacy of monetary policy for dealing with inflation um, is particularly a case of this second 
at this second theory, uh, second level, and even more so in the third level, when when the system as a whole breaks down and the central bank is now is now having is now facing the collapse of the international monetary system. Um, and so, what I want to mostly talk about today is the first two, one and two. If you want to hear about the third, just read Kindleberger, and I can give you some some citations. Um, but the hard problem for me is one and two, but we started with three, okay? And that is what gave us some clues for going forward. So here's some more words about the inside spread economy. Um, so in the inside spread economy, there there's mismatch in the flow, supply, and demand of commodities. And we're thinking of multiple commodities. So this is it's important that this is disaggregated. We're not using the macro trick of, of, of saying, oh, there's only one commodity uh, and one consumer and one producer. You know, we're thinking of multiple commodities, some of which may be in flow net surplus, some might be in flow net 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 deficit. Um, it's important from a money view point of view to emphasize that physical inventories have to be greater than zero. Okay, So there's a kind of survival constraint analog in this real economy, if you want to say it, in this, this market for goods that creates an inherent asymmetry um, in the system, just as the survival constraint does, right? That surplus agents and deficit agents are, fa are, are, not, are not just are not just mirror images, okay? It's gonna be different. And that asymmetry is gonna play out, you'll see in a minute, in important ways in the theory. The, in the trainer model, which if you've taken the MOOC, you, you know the trainer model, um, the in outside spread, value spread, is what supports the inside spread. The dealer is relying on the outside spread to uh, as uh, and it and it's making the market inside those spreads. So where does the outside spread come from for commodities? It seems that the outside ask should come from producers. They're selling commodities. So and and the outside bid comes from consumers. So um, those prices are what supports. So that's another place where prices come from is these outside asks and outside bids. But the dealer is making prices inside inside that spread. Um, it's important. Now to add, okay, the important role of a forward market. There's forward markets in many commodities too, particularly globally traded commodities, um, which are coordinating forward flow supply and demand. And what we observe in the world, um, what Keynes observed in the world, in fact, back in back in the 30s, okay, is normal backwardation, okay, that the that there's a, a, a deviation between expected between spot prices and and for and forward prices, between expected spot prices and forward prices. Um, and that and that deviation is in a particular direction. Normal that backwardation is normal. Okay, is, is he saying? And he developed from that idea. He was trading in commodity markets. Um, the idea that uh, that there's a liquidity premium in financial prices too, you know. And so that's a theory of the term structure and other things like that. He and Hicks did this as well in the interwar period. Um, the uh, normal backwardation. So I'm just now taking that back and saying we're used to the idea that there's a liquidity premium in financial prices. Um, let's. Let's remind ourselves that there's a financial premium in commodity prices also. And I'm adding the further assertion, I suppose, that this is a consequence of the asymmetry of the of the inventory constraint, um, that it's not symmetric. Okay. And so this shows up as a liquidity premium in prices. Now I, I mentioned Keynes and the theory of term structure. So now I'm putting it together in the fourth bullet point there. That the interest rate complex. The interest rate is not a price, not one price. It's a it's a it's a whole it's a whole complex of prices for different maturities and for different um, different uh, agents issuing and so forth. In the money and financial markets, we have liquid forward markets in for for treasury securities and so forth. Um, there are interest rate swaps, there are foreign exchange swaps. Um, characteristic of this financial uh, world is failure of the expectations hypothesis, failure of uncovered interest parity between exchange ex, as a theory of exchange rates, um, and now even covered interest parity. Those of you who've done the MOOC have seen all of that, where I talk, where I say that the failure of those of those expectations hypothesis is the is the source of dealer profit. Um, and so linking it to the trainer, linking it to the trainer model. Now I want to extend that to the goods market. 
and say that there are forward markets in goods too, and there are dealers. There's also embedded forwards in bilateral commodity contracts. So um, there's a hierarchy of the interest rate complex um, and arbitrage should equalize the liquidity premium across markets. So the liquidity premium in the world of money and finance should be the same as the liquidity premium in the world of goods. Um, and uh, that's our theory of the inside spread economy. Um, the outside spread economy is sort of different. Okay. Um, we're imagining that there's, in macroeconomic terms, there's a global dollar cycle, let's say, um, that so there's boom bust sort of inherent instability of credit. Um, and so every now and then you're going to, in a boom, you're going to face a cyclically binding inventory constraint, which is a seller's market um, where prices have reached their maximum. And that stimulates new production, but production takes time. So production so prices can move first. Once it hits that constraint, once it hits the 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 buyers, the buyer, the the outside ask, um, prices can spike. Okay, and quantities will come later. That might sound familiar. We're gonna about COVID. Okay, we're gonna come to that. Um, Meanwhile, okay, while production is coming online, new prices maybe get embedded in the, in the structure of prices, leading to an upward drift of the price level um, and the importance of expectations. Where are prices going to go? I got to write new contracts and so forth. So ex expectations become important in the outside spread economy. Um, and uh, and the uh, if you think of the asymmetry of the inventory constraint, that seems to suggest a long-term inflationary bias. You know that when you hit the hit the the the, the buyer's market, um, that that you're going to hit you're going that the inventory constraint binds at the at the seller's market uh, uh, point of view. However, and this is sort of this is something that um, I learned that Dan proposed in the last time we talked. As a matter of fact, that we might think of globalization as a as a as a as a background to this cycle, okay, that this is a structural thing, that globalization, this, the, the trend to globalization um, has, is maybe a trend toward a structural buyer's market, which is which has an opposite effect to this cyclical thing, where supply chain transmits this buyer's, the, the buyer's outside spread, you know, to upstream to producers. Um, and this pressure for lowering prices for the consumers leads dealers to minimize their inventory cushion, okay, just in time production, that that is the background to the COVID shock, that there were not very many, many inventories. And this came from this structural buyer's market pressure. So the commodity dealer system was turned out to be rather fragile to shocks. Once it got smacked, um, it just collapsed, really. You know, but here's the point that if you if globalization leads to a kind of structural buyer's market, you would think that would be have a sort of long-term deflationary bias that's countering the cyclical inflationary bias. So this is a typical kind of theme in the money view that that what we see in the world is the outcome of a battle between the forces of elasticity and the forces of discipline, the for the the inflationary versus the deflationary drift. Um, and that all of this stuff seems it seems hard to believe that monetary policy can affect things in, you know, the cyclically binding inventory constraint, that's an outside spread thing. The structural buyer's market, you know, that's an outside spread thing. This is not something monetary policy is going to be able to affect very efficaciously, um, but it can the inside spread economy. And I'm going to show you how. So how does monetary policy work in the inside spread economy? The idea is this, the central bank controls the short-term interest rate. Okay, um, which is the price of overnight liquidity. There's a price of, of delaying your settlement for overnight. Um, this gets transmitted to the broader interest rate comp complex in the money and finance world through dealers. This is lecture 12 in the MOOC. Um, and it gets transmitted to commodity prices similarly through the commodity dealer function. I'm going to show you some trainer models in a minute. I remind you inherent sim asymmetry in both of these cases. Um, and uh, and I remind you that we're not talking about a single commodity world, um, that there's going to be differential transmission of monetary policy depending on 
different commodities. Might Some might be at corner solutions, outside spreads, some might not be. Um, some of these commodities might be more important. So affecting their prices is going to have, have knock-on effects for others, systemically important commodities, so-called. Um, thinking there about the interaction um, through, uh, through a Leontief uh, input-output uh, matrix. This will have echoes of some literatures that, that you may have seen in this inflation debate, transitory versus uh, permanent inflation. Um, the uh, And then I'm just reminding you that this inside spread story um, about monetary policy transmission works for the inside spread, we're arguing, but maybe not so much for outside spread or for the breakdown economy. So as always in monetary policy, if you don't catch it soon, you could lose control of it. Um, at least through monetary policy, there might be other mechanisms. So here I'm just showing you some trainer diagrams as promised. So here is the the three trainer diagram thing that I use that I've been using for ten years um, to think about monetary policy transmission. Okay, as opposed to the money multiplier and that sort of thing, the this is this is through prices, not through banks making loans with excess reserves, but through affecting the dealer balance sheet and therefore the spread that they quote. So it's the Fed is controlling things in the far left of this diagram, okay, the overnight rate of interest, that then has effects on the money market rate of interest, which then, because people in the capital market are using money funding of capital lending, affects capital prices as well. Um, that's the story of monetary policy transmission in the in the money and financial world. Here's uh, not, not quite as pretty, not quite as worked out, but this is a, an extension of that idea for commodity markets, where the left-hand diagram is showing um, one rate of interest where you're show, you're seeing the outside spread. You can see there at, at 105 um, is the top and at, it looks like maybe, uh, Dan made this, maybe 95 is the, is the, is the outside bid. Um, and a change in the rate of interest, um, I suggest, um, reduces the capacity of dealers to hold inventories. Um, and so even if it doesn't change the outside spread at all, um, by making the, the bid-ask uh, uh, curves lower, you can see that at the same inventory, 2.5, okay, the bid-ask spread at 2.5 inventories is, is sort of the bottom is a little above 98, the top is a little above 99. Okay. Whereas with higher interest rates at 2.5, the bottom is 97. Okay. And the top is 98. So that just by mechanically through the economics of the dealer function, higher interest rates pushed by the central bank um, are going to put downward pressure on commodity prices that are for commodities that are traded in dealer markets. Okay. This is the point. Um, how important that effect is, may, this we need to investigate. This is where this is a theoretical framework that we can now maybe begin to take to the data a little bit. So this is me summing up now a little bit that monetary tightening has direct effect on commodity prices through the economics of the dealer function. Um, higher rates are are about discipline, causing lower pr prices. Lower rates are about elasticity, maybe allowing higher prices. Um, that's. I think the beginning of wisdom in thinking about how the money, a money view theory of the price level, um, but there's more. Okay, this is not the end of wisdom. This is not the answer to our question. Okay, and it's not the answer to our question because what economists think about when they when they mean the price level, okay, they're talking about something kind of different. Okay. They're talking about a weighted average of a subset of spot prices of goods that are purchased and consumed by consumers. Okay, They're not talking about primary inputs into production. They're not talking about goods where there's a well, where there's an active forward rate complex because they're globally traded raw commodities like oil or, 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 or wheat or something like that. They're talking about final goods and services. That's the price level that, that the economists care about for this distributional reason. So what's the link? between the, the primary products that we've just been talking about and these final processes. So here I am uh, appealing to Hicks, okay? And he begins his book, as I said, with some chapters about commodity markets. And his story, so this is 1989, is that there's a, there's a sort of supply chain, okay? Where there are dealers in primary goods, and that's a flex price world, okay? Um, 
I think there he's talking about the world that I've just been talking about. Okay, that but but that's not the end of the story for him. That manufacturers are buying inputs into production in those flex price models, and they are through time producing final goods. Um, and there's an inventory there, work in progress. Okay, and they're selling these goods um, wholesale, and there's an inventory there, and that in a warehouse somewhere, and the the wholesale uh, 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 merchant are selling retail to to retail uh to and there's a there's a there's an inventory there okay in the shop okay and the consumer is the final purchaser okay so um and and hicks insists that that this last stage okay is in general a fixed price uh a fixed price market where the 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 sellers to the consumers are not eager to move prices relative to the flow uh, flow supply and demand. They they make money by moving inventories, by absorbing fluctuations in in demand and supply in inventories. That's why they have shops full of inventories, um, and they then resupply themselves from warehouses, and the warehouses then resupply themselves from manufacturers. So that's the idea that it is in fact optimal. It's part of their business model for retail sellers. Um, to not uh, not to, to adjust with inventories, not with prices. Okay, so what's the link? What's the link? Here is a lovely thing that Dan put together, um, showing changes in these different kinds of inventories, uh, works in progress, manufacturing, wholesale inventories, retail inventories from the U.S. Census Bureau um, over the last COVID period, um, and he has. Uh, drawn vertical lines there for Federal Reserve policy. Um, and we know that after 2022, that Federal Reserve policy is increasing interest rates from zero to 5%. Um, but I show this just in stages. I show this just to show you that there's a lot of, these are changes in inventories, by the way, okay, there, that there's a lot of changes in inventories um, during this period. Um, there's a lot of action there, okay. We're thinking of the, you know, in normal macroeconomics, we think of inventories as a change in inventories as a as a as a as an aggregate demand. Okay, that this is either an increase in aggregate demand if you're increasing inventories, okay, or a decrease in aggregate demand if you're decreasing inventories. I suggest from the money view, we think of this as dealer optimization. The dealers are moving their prices, okay, or they're or they're or they're using inventories to not move their prices. Um, that that we need to investigate. That we need to think of this as an economics of the dealer function, and that's where that needs to be developed. That hasn't been done yet. But here is just some data to tell you what are we trying to explain. This is what we're trying to explain maybe in thinking about the link between flex price at the beginning of this supply chain and fixed price at the end of the supply chain. So here's the kind of story that, that we propose is that, and it follows Hicks, okay, that fic, thinking of the fixed price sector as a, as a price level anchor of some kind. And specifically, he he talks about this um the labor market okay that uh, some labor markets are fixed price and some are flex price a, he has a dual labor market theory there um and here's the important point that labor's fixed price is a real price okay that that what labor is bargaining for okay is is a real wage, you know, a real consumption wage, okay? And they are willing to defend this against inflation. The real wage at any moment in time reflects the relative power of labor versus capital, um, and uh, and they will defend it, okay, against any de depreciation um, due to inflation with a lag. It doesn't happen right away. Um, so this is the anchor in the modern economy, not gold, okay? It's a fixed it's a fixed price of a certain kind of labor. Prices fluctuate. Um, that's an anchor, but but it's not not all prices are it's that doesn't stabilize prices. Prices move around that, okay? And we think of the money view theory of the price level as a swinging circle around this uh, around this fixed point. And the word swinging circle, um, I want you to have in mind, um, comes from anchors. 
for a boat. Right? When you put an anchor in with the length of of the of the mooring cable, um, as the winds change, your boat can can swing around in a circle, um, depending if if the winds shift from east to west. Um, and if the winds get strong enough, okay, you're going to be dragging that anchor. Okay, um, and in fact, maybe you're going to break that anchor. So this three level theory of price, okay, is about that. Okay. Dragging the anchor is the second level, uh, you know, when you're hitting the outside spread and breaking the anchor, that's the breakdown where you then run ashore because the wind is pushing you against the reef. Um, I've just, I'm just back, by the way, from, from vacation in Key West, where its main industry for many decades was wrecking, meaning, meaning <laughs> going out to ships that had just, just, um, ran against the reef and taken all the products and and you get you get finders keepers. Um, so this is what made Key West the richest per capita place in the United States for a little while was uh, taking care of these wrecks. So perhaps this was inspired by me being there and going to these museums about the wrecking industry. All of the all of the uh, roads are named after ship captains who made all their money in the wrecking business. Um, so uh, there that's an image to have in mind for the kind of theory we're proposing. Um, but here's another image. So this dual labor market, um, so Lewis, 1954, um, is a theory of the dual economy for developing economies. That's what he's concerned about, which have ex, you know, surplus labor, he called it, you know, in the countryside, in traditional, uh, on the farm. Um, and you're trying to develop your economy, and that requires a 30% increase in wages to attract people from the farm into the city, into manufacturing. So you're moving them from this surplus labor economy into modern, uh, into modern. And uh, the depending on the man, how as the as the manufacturing sector grows, it pulls more and more labor supply from the secondary sector. Um, he's thinking about this in sort of steady state term because he's thinking about economic development. But from our point of view, we could think of this. There's a cycle there too. There's going to be a cyclical mismatch um, that uh, as manufacturing grows in cycles. Um, and that's going to probably move this wage spread. Um, that you're, you're, it's going to be higher in booms, lower in contractions. You don't need to attract people from the farm when there's a manufacturing recession. You know, so you're that this dynamic is the dynamic of the of the anchor, and not just for a developing economy. So Hicks, in this 1989 book, makes a distinction between the fixed price of unionized labor, okay, and the flex price of non-unionized labor. So there's a dual economy that he has in mind there in 1989. And Temin in a recent in a recent book proposes that this dual economy th model works for the United States too, that there's this um, primary sector, 20% of employment in finance, tech, and in electronics. And then there's this huge, you know, US, the secondary sector. Um, so, and, and, and possibly, so here's my third example. You might think I'm just thinking here about unionized versus ununionized. You might think globally here that really what is determining the price, this anchor globally, is the, is is the interplay between the European unionized labor market, okay, and the Chinese non-unionized labor market, um, which is the surplus labor in this global supply chain system at the at the moment. Um, so the wage complex is an is the anchor. Last two slides now. One. Just linking this to the COVID shock, okay. Um, so the idea, what if you remember, is that globalization means that we're in a structural buyer's market most of the time, okay, except at at, at cyclical peaks, okay. What this shock does is to throw the entire supply chain, okay, into seller's market status, you know. All the inventory stock out right away because there's hardly any of them. You get price spikes. Um, this is a this is, was about a relative demand shift from services to goods, um, but it it was a global supply chain shock because supply chains were global, um, and so you saw these price spikes for system for systemically important commodities. There was a production adjustment and response, but it took a while. So we had this period of rising prices. Um, that's one thing. 
So now think about the central bank's activity. So the central bank's activity during this period was, first of all, zero interest rate policy continuing um, and forbearance, relaxing settlement constraints everywhere. Remember, mortgages were you, you and rents and all kinds of things. There was forbearance, accommodation um, of this and, and, and the consequence of was that it was possible for these prices to move up. That accommodated them. But that's stopping in the last year or two with moving interest rates from zero to five. We think in the money view that this is like a transition from a war economy to a peace economy, from an outside spread economy to an inside spread economy. And uh, we're stabilizing prices at a new higher level and nominal wages too at a new higher level, maybe even a new wage complex because of work from home and things like that. Um, and uh, that's what that's the period that we're in right now, and tr and trying to get back to this global supply chain restoration of globalization, where there might be again a, a deflationary uh, push from that. There are some little signs of that, but those are early days, I think, for that. So that's how, if you were to take this into analytical frame to the facts of the COVID shock, these might be things that you would point out. As I say, this is. This slide was made, you know, just a week ago. So these are, I'm just working this out. It's not, I'm not prepared to defend every word of it. Um, I'm putting it out there to stimulate conversation. Um, now, here's my promised slide for Pablo, okay, saying that I, I've been talking about sort of the United States and the global north. And I want to emphasize that um, the experience of inflation is going to be different depending on where you are in the international hierarchy of money and finance and also the international hierarchy of of the global supply chain okay where what part of that supply chain you are you are uh you are part of so i remind all you know people who are have been on these calls before that we think of the international monetary system as a hierarchical system with the dollar at the top the global north is sort of next down tied in with these liquidity swap lines so the yen the canadian dollar the euro the swiss franc the british pound and the global south is mostly all below that and some of these are even farther down so just reminding you that this is a hierarchical uh system that means the liquidity premium is not going to be the same you know there's going to be deviation across this this hierarchy um thinking about the problem of countries that are not the united states okay instead of thinking of the labor market as the anchor, they have another anchor, which is the international dollar. So in a certain sense, they're on the gold standard, okay? Uh, and that's their anchor. Um, and there's a domestic swinging circle that they have to deal with. They also have labor markets domestically, but but to be part of the international trading system, you need to manage that interface with the global trading system. Um, the, the theory of inflation for different countries in this hierarchy is going to be differentiated depending on your access to global dollar capital markets, short run and long run, your domestic labor market conditions, um, and by your degree of financial development. You know, do you actually have a financial development, a dealer system in your own in your own economy. So this swinging circle um, is going to be different um, in, in, in different countries. And we saw that there's in, in the chat at the beginning that inflation rates are different across the across the globe. Um, the countries that seem to have really very high inflation right now seem to be those who are being affected by the, the Israel Gaza war. Um, but but we can talk about uh, about that. Um, and that's the end. And thank you very much. And I look forward to getting some feedback on this. You know, is this a good direction? Um, and uh, uh, where do you see the the problems? Um, where do you see the opportunities? Stop share. Thank you very much, Perry. And then Dan also by extension for uh, putting this contribution forward. Um, I think just a quick word. I, what I what I really appreciate about the approach is that it now gives us a canvas to have a debate on from a money perspective. I really uh, didn't have that before personally, and I think now we have terms of debate that have now put out for us to even think about the problem properly. So I really do appreciate that, and look forward to Pablo's comments. So Pablo, was yours? Hi. Well, thanks for the opportunity uh, to. To discuss this, uh, these slides, these these uh, these ideas, 
Uh, I have many random thoughts. Uh, some uh, come from uh, reading previously the the slides. Some come from uh, most of them come from uh, listening carefully to Perry's presentation. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, what I like about uh, the approach, it's very open. Uh, it can accommodate. I mean, there sure there sure is uh, a lot of uh, previous work which uh, from many different traditions, mostly heterodox, but uh, that are very, comp and which I like, I personally like, which are very compatible and I will mention them along. Uh, but uh, there are also many contributions um, from uh, great thinkers which uh, who have not been quoted and I think uh, can contribute to this, uh, to this view. And Perry knows them better than I do. Uh, my first name, uh, the first name that came to my mind was uh, Hotry. Uh, Hotry has a lot to say about inventories and working capital. And so does uh, Keynes in the Treatise on Money. So those, actually, uh, uh, Keynes had a theory of the, uh, a very rudimentary theory of the business cycle in 1921-22, uh, which he wrote in in the newspaper, uh, one that he edited, I think, in the New Statement, um, in which he blamed uh, these ups and downs after the first after the ending of the First World War on merchants, on a, on a, um, inventory changes uh, and speculation of merchants, which are similar in my view to the role that dealers played in uh, Merlin's uh, in Perry's presentation. Um, I have one one big big point to uh, question at least for to open the debate. How can globalization be important in the outside spread economy and not be important in the inside spread economy? Perhaps I'm misinterpreting this. Perhaps a structural buyer's um, situation is the inside, the, the inside spread economy. That was not my reading. Um, but for me, globalization is present all along the way. I may under, I may agree that a difference is globalization is present in the inside uh, spread as long as physical inventories are positive. That might be a line, but it is not clearly stated in the presentation because globalization appears in the outside spread uh, slide not in the inside spread slide. And I think um, that is an important uh, point uh, because it also gives a, a, a role. Uh, le let me go back one point before. I generally agree uh, with the um, point that Perry makes that in the outside spread, uh, spread world, the Fed is not uh, the central bank and mainly the Fed, is not so powerful. I may agree to some extent that in the inside spread war, uh, it has some power. I would argue, discuss how much, but let's give it, uh, let's give the point, uh, let's grant it. Um, but through globalization and global value chains, actually going against my point, the Fed has a lot to, to, to say. Uh, the BIS has a, a lot of recent work and they have emphasized that global value chains are finance intensive and they are dollar centered. So uh, even in the inside, even in an inside spread situation, perhaps a channel for the Fed to uh, to succeed in controlling inflation may happen through its influence on the dollar on global value chains. Uh, that is something that may, may uh, add to, may contribute to the to developing the money view. 
Um, that was the, my major, major point. Uh, so now go, go comes um, some scattered uh, thoughts that I randomly uh, uh, wrote uh, during the presentation. Um, uh, swinging anchors. Uh, for me, um, the literature on conflict inflation comes straight to the point. And uh, conflict inflation is you have a target, different sectors have different targets which are not mutually, uh, mutually compatible. Swinging anchors refers to moving the target, which is, uh, so it's not a, a, a different situation, it's a different level of analysis. Uh, putting, uh, is keeping the anchor stable may imply, you know, on a theoretical level I'm talking about, right? Uh, may imply a ceteris parius analysis of the anchor itself. You take the anchor as given, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a theoretical analysis and not necessarily a, sit, a situational analysis. Because I believe, um, perhaps not, mm, I believe that the anchor moves perhaps bumpily and discreetly, not continuously. I can grant that, but still, um, it's not. It, it is a in the analysis. It is a different. It is a different level of theoretical analysis, and not necessarily a situational analysis. Um, the mention um, to 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 this one BIS I mentioned. Um, hmm. Then comes a uh, fix versus flex and uh, the inclusion. Uh, when you put uh, unions and uh, non-unions in one of the last uh, bullet points, uh, that's something very important for me. Um, I'm very much against uh, drawing a, uh, a monotonous uh, Phillips curve. And at some point you will discuss, I, I assume you will discuss a Phillips score, particularly regarding uh, anchors. Um, I'm very much against a, Phillips, a monotonous Phillips score. It is either flat or it is not monotonous. And it, uh, it enters the discussion of fixed versus flex because you clearly emphasize the role of institutions. For me, uh, uh, unions are one of these um, the institutions, different um, labor arrangements all across Europe, because even within Europe, there are very different uh, uh, union arrangements, labor market institutions. One could and even say, uh, compare Biden versus uh, Clinton or Obama. Both have, have similar uh, unemployment rates. And I don't know, but uh, they may have similar uh, la uh, labor participation rates and similar employment rates. And yet, yet the, the well, the, the pa labor power and the capa capacity and capabilities to defend targets is completely different in the Clinton years versus the Biden years. Uh, so um, what is fixed and what is flex is, um, is also uh, a, a, an institutional issue a lot. Um, I, li I like the point uh, when you point out, when you mention Leontief. Uh, one could also say something similar, saying that, well, what Leontief co uh, calls sy uh, systemically important in Strafa are called basic prices. So these are commodities that enter in the production of themselves. I, and that changes and complicates the story, right? Now, uh, Higgs is a vertical story from uh, inputs, inventor, um, yeah, inputs, what are called initially flex prices, wholesale, manufacturing, consuming. The NTF is and Astrafa are horizontal. There is no time there. So, uh, and actually that's uh, one of the things that I, um, I mean, it's fine for analyzing a photo. Uh, they uh, it's difficult to, to see how they can analyze a movie. 
So uh, one thing to discuss perhaps in the money view is how to make the story compatible between a photo, somebody who tries to shoot a photo and somebody who tries to shoot a film. Uh, that might uh, give uh, an interesting role. That might be something interesting for uh, for uh, to discuss. Um, one point through which you can make them compatible is precisely the real wage. Uh, as, is it an, uh, if it is an anchor, how it is affected by uh, basic and non-basic prices. <laughs> Um, perhaps a footnote should be devoted to uh, differentiate certain commodities, the importance of certain commodities. One is, uh, let's put it a name, copper or iron, and the other wheat or rice. Now, people do not eat copper, uh, but they do eat rice and wheat. So that, uh, that may affect the 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 anchor mm -hmm. uh, that may have an effect on the anchor. This is a flex price. A fre flex prices having different impact on anchors. Um, that is, that was one major point that I wanted to to say. And as you can see, many of these points that I made actually had a global south point of view, right? The, the global uh, development of uh, the, the global character of uh, global value chains and the importance of the dollar. Um, the BIS is mostly in agreement with you because, uh, because of the impact of the dollar on global value chains and uh, the intensive financial character of global value chains, depreciations are contractionary for a, in the view of the BIS, which is opposite to the IMF, opposite. Um, and so that may, lead, that may be a transition, a, a traverse from an inside spread to a, a, an outside spread world. Uh, obviously, there are shocks that might, like COVID, that might send you straight into an outside spread or even breakdown, war, etc. But this can be, uh, um, if if pushed to if pushed too hard, a monetary policy that tries to uh, um, control, to keep an inside spread uh, economy through this uh, non-intuitive for Global North uh, effects of a contractionary policy, it might lead to an um, outside spread war. And the example is uh, the 1980s, the Latin American debt crisis, which was not only in Latin America, but was, all, was a, I mean, it also affected the East Europe, Africa, et cetera. And it is not a it's, it's not a coincidence building on the importance of the dollar that uh, all the, the rest of the world, Latin America and Africa uh, and East Europe, had a hyperinflation at that time, right? So, uh, it's, which is a breakdown situation in your um, view. And that and coming to the present, uh, well, I, I've seen all the different um, in, uh, inflation rates that people put in the in the chat. Uh, Argentina, I, I see. I I know that the U.S. has managed to, in the last six months, they say to keep interest uh, inflation rate close to the target of the Fed, relatively close of two percent. There is a two percent, a two as well in the inflation rate of Argentina, but it has a one and a one um, to the right. So we have two hundred and eleven percent of inflation rate last year, and twenty five last month. Um, but there are other uh, uh, developing countries which are in the single digit, and many of them, uh, and for a long time. 
for a long time. In Latin America, the example I always tell people to look at is in spite of the enormous amount of problems that the country has, Peru. In one uh, in very interesting country to look at from the from the money view perspective, from any perspective, honestly, would be Peru. Um, why? Well, one issue is the last bullet point in your last PowerPoint which is the development of the financial system, of the domestic financial system. It is very, very important um, because um, you talked about the hierarchy of the dollar. I, I prefer talking about the hierarchy of the US financial system. Uh, so it is a hierarchy of financial systems, not of currencies. Of course, the dollar is at the top. Yes, fine. But it is because the Fed and the US financial system that is at the top. Uh, developing countries have managed to develop and strengthen their, uh, with the exception of Argentina, uh, let's say it's generally speaking, uh, have um, managed to uh, develop their financial system and achieve a high um, and to manage inertia there is a word that I, I would like to see how you discuss which is inertia uh, obviously in contracts but for me the the word is inertia uh, Argentina has a 20 percent mostly inflation rate due to inertia uh, and uh, Brazil has managed to lower their inflation and or many other countries in Latin America because of their inertia, which, are, which affects the pass-through and therefore the importance of the dollar for domestic prices. It's still very much relevant for uh, developing countries, much more than for the US, yes, sure, but um, uh, the degree of development of the financial system affects the pass-through, in my view. Uh, and uh, that's something to look into. And last, we, okay, last point, last, we'll take last it. one, the last one, last one. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Higgs and bring Higgs. For me, the, uh, I mentioned institutions, I mentioned different stages. And uh, one, the, my favorite phrase of Higgs is monetary theory is in uh, history as no other field in, in economics. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, that's all something that I always keep in mind when analyzing financial and monetary development. Um, and I, I think that the money view is all about, I mean, it goes hand in hand with monetary history, uh, but um, it's always it's a quote that, uh, that I always keep in mind when, when looking at this stuff. And I'm done. Thank you, Pablo. And I'm hate to be the the discipliner of this session. Um, um, it, here's a follow a suggestion. Obviously, we're supposed to start the next session in a couple of minutes. But I would like to everybody that has any sort of contribution right now to quickly state that contribution in a very in very brief terms, is either as a question or a comment. And we'll give Perry a very quick and maybe Dan also a quick response to those to those questions and the comments that have been, that have been raised. And we'll find time later in the program to uh, immer immerse ourselves in in the now the controversies that have now emerged from from uh, the contribution. Does that sound like, like a plan? And then we'll uh, set the right time for the start of the next session. Does that sound okay? Um, are you suggesting that this be in the chat? People just put this in the chat? So what I'm suggesting right now is that uh, anybody that now raises their hand or has something in the chat has a chance to very briefly state their point. Okay. And we go around the room. Okay. Um, Jay, since... Jay, I will uh, I will take responsibility for making up our lost time and uh, and ending my session on time, even if we run a little bit long now. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, th that's what I was hoping. So let's create elasticity here so we have discipline later. Um, Let's start in order. Uh, everybody has their hand up right now. We'll be called on, but uh, let's start in the chat with, um, I believe it was James, you were the first one to ask a question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so 
this was a lot to take in. It's a pretty brilliant model, and I can tell you've spent a long time on it. I will certainly be chewing on it for a number of years myself. Um, it's anticipated some of my own criticisms uh, that I was intending to throw at you for the fourth price of money. Um, namely, you've anticipated um, fixed prices or administered prices, and you your way of um, adding the trainer model to this, very smart, especially because it deals with some of the heterogene uh, heterogeneity in the price level. That isn't really dealt with in um, standard economics, where it just treats it as it's all level when it's not. Um, so kudos to you for that. You've dealt with some of the heterogeneity in the price level um, through through this. Very smart. Um, my first question is that um, in emails last year, I asked you for the original source of the idea of the uh, prices of money, and the two of us weren't able to find the original author, uh, if you remember. Um, I asked because we money viewers... Uh, if we're to build on your work and these ideas, we should probably have some kind of criteria for defining what can and can't be a price of money um, and a criteria of proving or disproving them. In 2009, you only had three. In 2012, you had four. Um, how can we find or discover a new price of money or how do we rule out what is and isn't a price of money? because I have criticisms of the price level as, as a price of money, namely because it's it's not homogenous enough. Um, it's just an average of prices. It's not a price itself. When it comes to the exchange rate, we don't average out the exchange rates and say the average of the exchange rates is the price is, is the price of money. We just take the exchange rate. With um, interest rates, yes, the interest rates are different, but we have a homogeneous unit, time. That's not the case when it comes to the price level and goods. These are these are heterogeneous. Uh, they're heterogeneous, and so this causes an issue. But um, I just want to know, like, what are your thoughts on how we can come up with defining what is or what can't be a price of money? Thank you, James. Very good points. Uh, Luis was the next one in the chat. Luis cannot use his mic, so I'll read his question for us. If I can find it, one second. Okay, Luis asks, what do you think about the possibility of using a primary policy tool other than short-term interest rates to influence the distribution of currency in the monetary policy transmission mechanism? Do you think interest rates are the only possible primary tool or MOS as secondary tools? For market operations as secondary tools work to affect interest rates. So that was Luis's question. Uh, next one in the chat was Mayank. You want to go ahead and ask your question or should I read it as well? Okay, Mayank, uh, I'll read your question. Where does trade and finance availability and unavailability of availability of credit affect global trade and price levels? During global financial crisis, trade um, during global financial crises, trade credit dried up, causing decline in trade. That was your question. All right, then we have Alex, also with his hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, so I have two comments. Um, I really like the idea that the economics of the dealer function can result in a direct transmission mechanism from monetary policy to commodity prices. I hadn't thought about that, that before. Now it's on my mind. Um, the other thing is I like the anchor analogy too, but I think there's an important anchor that you might be missing, um, albeit with a uh, with a wide circle, um, which is that too much price level instability means that you can't use your money as money anymore. So there's this kind of monetary stability constraint that's always there. Um, under a gold standard, you choose gold as your money standard, partly because its price in the market is stable and you expect it to kind of continue to be stable. Um, if a giant asteroid made of gold landed on the earth, that would kill the, the gold standard though. Um, so today, without being pegged to a particular commodity standard, um, we need another source of monetary stability. And that's where the central bank comes in and the central bank stabilizing price levels. So I think perhaps you too easily dismissed the role of 
of central banks in stabilizing the price level and how critical that is. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm gonna stick with the people with, hand, with hands up right now. Anush, you're next. Thanks, this was uh, wonderful and um, lovely to see how this is uh, developed. Um, few comments. The I guess first just at a high level, the the idea that the classical the classical dichotomy, um, I think it's uh, alive in a different form. So the clearly there's some distinction between real and banking monetary phenomena. Um, but that idea is distinct from the idea that money is a neutral veil. So I think we can dispense with the uh, neutrality element of that dichotomy, but that distinction is still there. And in a sense, that distinction has come, has been reformatted in this idea of the inside and outside spread economies, right? Manufacturing is there, inventory is there, even the central bank is having limitations in the outside spread world. Political economy is there in terms of the balance between capital and labor, supply chains. Um, so, of course, these have all come through through the kind of balance sheet method and the balance sheet logic, which I think is really, in a sense, the strongest part of the money view. It's not it, it starts by looking at money because you can see the interlocking of balance sheets clearest and best in the in 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 the monetary system. But of course, it is a way of looking at the economy as a set, as a system of interlocking balance sheets. So to, so to see manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers as kinds of dealers, and then them interacting with commodity dealers um, as a way of linking up these uh, inside and outside spread economies, sort of continues this method and spreads it to the kind of to understanding. Um, non-financial balance sheets where the asset side is production or something like, or inventories or something like that. Um, my question is, if there are key currencies, then of course there are also key commodities. Um, and this came up in the idea of systemic in, uh, systemically important commodities and fixed price sector. I mean, of course, these are also Marxian ideas, classical ideas. I th that's let's um, not, uh, if we're talking about uh, labor and sort of socially necessary uh, labor time and so on. I think one has to hat tip marks there as well. But there are other key commodities. Uh, um, food was mentioned, oil, metals, certain minerals, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so there's the, the world of commodity. The commodity space is is also hierarchical, just as the monetary space is hierarchical. And my question is, um, to what extent are a substantial set of these key commodities traded in commodity dealers' markets? Because that, of course, is the link between the inside and the outside. Some are, uh, some have different co combinations of, of um, you know, fixed price architectures were mentioned uh, and so on and so forth, which of course have their own politics to them. Um, there are institutionally fixed prices. Um, you have combinations where you have OPEC on the one hand, which is, which is if you like, the outside anchor for oil, but that's deeply political. And then built on top of that, you have a dealer system. So there are different ways in which these things gear up. Um, and I think the dealer market to, to invoke the global south, the data market is just the kind of, um, not just, but it is at a higher level, one can see it as a kind of global north institutional pathway from key commodities to the price level. But other uh, um, areas have other institutional pathways, non-dealer system pathways from key commodities to prices. Um, and of course, these pathways in a globalized system interact. Um, so, so that's by way of comment, but also, question in terms of um you know how far can we extend the key commodity system to the dealer the dealer function thanks thank you Anush excellent question okay um I see there's a couple more in the chat um if you are eager you can now take the the mic we'll take three more questions from the chat and then we'll let Perry and Dan respond who would like to go? May we start with uh, Bob McCauley, who asked the simplest question. The, the point was made that uh, there's just one exchange rate and I analogous to price indices, there are exchange rate indices as opposed to bilateral exchange rates. That was a simple point. Great. Karen, you go next. Uh, yes. 
Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with the basic unit that you were talking about. I found your model very complicated. It's certainly not going to be a bestseller anytime soon, I would say. Um, but um, basically, what is is there a fixed point somewhere which some people classically calls value in commodities? Or is everything just a question of price fluctuations that somehow converge onto uh, rising prices because of dealers and supply chains, supply demand uh, differentials? Or is there some basic movements beneath all of that? And for example, I could well imagine that you have high the demand for something at the same time prices will fall because there's also uh, other limits in the system and, that, and other factors. For example, productivity changes that make it cheaper to produce. How does that enter your consideration? I was very um, perplexed or I don't know, perplexed about your using the wage unit as a basic standard uh, if you notice, uh, Keynes in his general theory talks about both the wage unit and the labor unit as standards of output, and it never really gets to any solution of this. And of course, it's the same thing as the old classical Marxian uh, problem of uh, labor time, which is uh, longer than the wages that workers receive. In this way, anyway, and you don't have to buy that, but uh, where's profit in your analysis? Can that be dissolved all of that into labor? It cannot, of course. So so, so I would like, I, I think that that aspect has to be developed further um, and before, and because it seems to me that a lot of these movements about dealers outside, inside, and I don't know what, is a little bit accidental and could be anything, any different times, but not really a theoretical firm structure. Thank you. All right, I think we leave it there. Those who didn't get a chance, uh, I'm very sorry. We'll cut it here for now. Um, we'll give it back to Perry and maybe Dan to give some comments for the next couple of minutes. Um, okay. Um, there's a lot to think about here, um, so I won't answer all of them. I'll just maybe pick and choose a few. Um, I remind you that I'm giving another talk tomorrow and another one on Sunday, um, and that I'll be at the liquidity happy hours um, as well. So there, I this is I've set aside uh, a chunk of my life here for this. So um, we don't, it doesn't all have to be happened right now. Okay. So I particularly now Pablo had the benefit that he had a copy of the PowerPoint beforehand. So his I would like to give him a uh, sort of premium place because he's thinking about this, you know, and uh, there and and so and a number of his suggestions are very, very helpful. Um, he mentions he mentions Hawtrey, yes, yes, and Keynes. You'll see tomorrow I'll talk about the, the British tradition, Hawtrey, Keynes, so forth, um, sayers that build that build on this. And particularly Hawtrey is thinking about global commodity markets, as a matter of fact, um, in inventories and thinking about how the Bank of England moving the rate of interest, you know, he's thinking about speculation and movements in the prices. So we I'll talk about that tomorrow. That's right. I do know about Hawtrey um and 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 the treatise and so forth. Um this Point you make about globalization being important in the inside economy. At first, I thought, oh well, of course it is because globalization is affecting the outside spread, and the outside spread affects the inside spread. So that is natural. But you did have an additional point, which is appreciating that the global price that we're talking about is a dollar price. Okay, and so that's quite important. Okay, and you're right; that is a dimension of this that is not in this story. Okay, that that I think is very key for closing the loop to bring this to, to the global south and supply chains that stretch from the global south to the north. I've made a big note on that. Um, theories of conflict inflation, you're, you're right. There's a lot of, I've had a lot of influence from other people that I'm not necessarily citing in this PowerPoint. I was reading Taylor and Barbosa really about conflict theory in, in the south and also in, and also exchange rate, you know, and that was, that very much was in my mind when I was writing those things about the global South. Um, 
in the my discussion of Leontief is because uh, I was reading Weber and her 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 stories about uh, about the COVID price shock. Um, I hadn't thought about Sarafa basic prices or at all, but uh, that seems right to bring that in. Um, the global south, the balance of payments. So you mentioned the nineteen eighties debt crisis. You know these are these are balance of payments problems. So this is a survival constraint. You know, and this is where the rubber hits the road about the dollar anchor. Um, and you can't hold that dollar anchor anymore. Um, and so I I I think I was hoping, um, Pablo, that you would push me to think about how to expand this to the global south. And I'm not disappointed. So thank you, thank you very much um, about that. Um, the source of the four prices idea is, I think, Shaw, but I haven't found it. I don't know where it is. Um, and I think there will only be four. There won't be more. There always were four. It's just I was only ever talking about the first three. If it seems like I added a fourth, it's because I decided to recognize the fourth, you know, but I knew there was a fourth one from the very beginning. I just punted on it, you know, and and because I and and this comes to Karen's point, because it felt to me like the price level is a very complicated thing. It's an index. It's a very complicated thing. And so it's going to be a complicated story. It's not going to be MV equals P. T. It's really not. That's that's clearly a bad story about the price level. But I don't really have anything of simple of of similar simplicity to offer. So that's. I think it is a simple story if you already know the money view and are used to thinking of the world in dealer models and so forth. That you 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 can see how things fit together. But I appreciate that that it is not MV equals PT. Um, it's not. It's it's much more difficult. Trade credit. Yes, um, that's right. Um, you know, so uh, to Anoush, I the point. I think we are in agreement here that what I'm trying to urge, and you'll see in the talks uh, on particularly on Sunday, understanding money, the money system as infrastructure for the market economy. Yes, that is the money view point of view. That that it's not a veil. Okay, it's infrastructure, and so therefore you. That's where it connects to the real economy. Okay, and that the institutional infrastructure. Um, and but you're right to point out there may be you know I am I'm excessively focused on the north non-dealer pathways and particularly important one as other people were mentioning basic commodities for the wage bargain you know are going to play into this you know if the wage bargain is an anchor and the price of wheat goes up you know you are immediately pushing that anchor around you know that's not even though that's only one good you know just the price of rice you know that's immediately pushing your anchor around um and so it's not surprising that many countries like that stabilize the price of rice you know and they try to use government mechanisms to do that um because if that price isn't stable you have there's hell to pay you know and they and then they run out of money they try to be dealers in rice and then they run out of money so i think you've given me lots of suggestions for how to make this to how to extend this idea to the global south that i think is the main is the main challenge um because i've been focusing so much on the north and on on a uh, on a on a critical view of of the standard story which seems to me so implausible you know, in, intertemporal infinite horizon, you know, terminal conditions are are nailing down today's price level. It seems it seems a fantasy, you know, that it is just not true that central banks are that there's a we need a theory of price level that does not require these implausible kinds of assumptions. You know, it, it that cannot be true. It just cannot be true. Talk about a complicated model. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'll leave it at there. And I hope I can get a copy of this chat so I can think about these things more afterwards. Uh, I'm I'm sure that that's possible. So you're we saving will have all that for you, Perry. Yeah. Yes. Um, if Dan has the urge to speak, you have the floor. I, I'll speak for just a minute, and then I will speak for much longer on a different topic. But um, but thank you, Perry, for uh, for being willing to get into this. We don't, it's not even a draft yet. It's it's a bunch of uh, pieces of paper and a lot of telephone conversations that Perry and I have had. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, and I appreciate Perry's willingness to uh, share it with all of you. It does feel like the ideas are coming together. I just wanted to, it's a work in progress, and uh, and some work is happening even as we speak. So here's a new That's version. That's a much nicer chart. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I, I, when, you were, when I heard you explaining it, I realized what the problem was, and so, uh, so I, I made it look like this. 
um, which I, I hope you can. And I took off the numbers, which are just a distraction. So, um, so when you shorten the when you shorten the maximum inventory, both curves bend down. There it is. Um, so it's a work in progress, and we are working on it. I'll uh, I'll just say uh, thank you very much to to all of you for the questions and uh, and the feedback. And uh, I think we'll keep thinking about it, but you'll certainly be among the first to see um, when this starts to come together. As a, I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, look forward to continuing the conversation.